relationship. You know, I, I have. But what's interesting to me is the messy relationship that comes to mind is one that I actually thought was rather clean. And hmm. I congratulated myself for it being so clean throughout most of the relationship. You are not a person where I go, yeah, Cheryl Street, clean relationships. <laughs> clean really. Well, what it was is I was 26, and it was right before I went to hike the Pacific Crest Trail. It was that kind of year before. Mm. And I was working in a restaurant in Minneapolis. I was a waitress. And I, I ended up having sexual things in other words, <laughs> sex, with literally like five of the guys who worked at this restaurant. And strangely, that wasn't the messy part. So one of these guys was a, really a friend of mine. You know, we became friends over the course of our working relationship. And, and we didn't start off having sex with each other. He was actually the, the last guy of the line uh, at that restaurant who I had sex with. And it was, you know, our main bond was one of friendship. And we were what I guess you call friends with benefits. That's what the kids call it these days. Mm-hmm. It was before we called it friends with benefits. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I thought, wow, this is a very tidy experience where it is just a physical experience. And, and I wouldn't say just a physical experience, an erotic experience okay. that is not connected to other kinds of desires, or so I believed. Uh-huh. Okay? So here we are. I have this friendship. We're occasionally having sex. And we decide to drive across the country together. Uh, from Minneapolis to Portland, where I now live and where we're recording the show. Yes. So we're driving from Minneapolis to Portland. We would drive all day and have these long conversations. And at night, we would camp in, like, National Forest Land and, and have, have sex. have very non-romantic sex. Have non-romantic sex. It is the dream. It You're is the dream. You're living the dream, yeah. It was fun. Lewis and Clark, by the way, exact same exact story. Same exact, story. Just imagine buckskin, but it's the same story. <laughs> That's right. We actually followed, you know, we were on their path, essentially. We were on the Lewis and Clark Trail. So, but throughout the day, uh, what my friend would talk to me about is this woman who had broken up with him a few months before. Mm. So right before he and I, you know, started our little friends with benefits thing, he'd had his heart crushed by this woman who had moved to Portland. Oh, boy. And he was still in love with her. And I didn't have any jealousy whatsoever when he told me about his feelings for her and the whole relationship drama that they were going through, which was mostly just his heart being broken and her not being interested in him. But we arrive in Portland, okay? We had slept together really only hours before. We arrive in Portland, and he immediately calls his ex-girlfriend. Yeah. And he says, hey, you know, I'm here. Cheryl and I have arrived, and we're going to go grab dinner. Do you want to join us? Yeah. And so she says, sure, she does. So the three of us have dinner. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, it's so great to meet you. I've heard so much about you. And we're having this dinner. And throughout the course of the dinner, the only way I can describe it is it was like suddenly I could barely speak because if I spoke, I was going to burst into tears. Oh, my God. I was humiliated. I was jealous. I was sad. And I was ashamed because I realized that it wasn't so clean and tidy, that it was messier than I thought, that I did care that a guy I had just slept with the night before was now having dinner with me and this woman he actually had feelings for. And what was amazing to me, too, I think that so much of growing up and taking um, responsibility in your relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, it's realizing also what's your own damn fault. Mm -hmm. And this was my own damn fault. I wasn't mad at him because I told him it was okay to have sex with me and not want to be involved with me romantically. I I, I told him that I didn't want him to be my boyfriend and I didn't want to be his girlfriend. And what I did is I was wrong. I was wrong about my own feelings about a relationship. Hmm. It was really one of the very last times that I made that sort of mistake in a relationship. Right. Where I gave away something that I shouldn't have, yeah. which was essentially my body. Well, your heart, too. A little bit of it. A little bit of it. I think it's okay to have sex for just physical erotic reasons. Mm-hmm. But what I decided at that time of my life is that I was done doing that. Hmm. That I'd explored everything that I needed to explore in having those experiences. And I wasn't interested in doing that anymore. Yeah. I wanted to stop playing that sort of game with my heart and my body. Yeah. Well, it's 
perfect uh, way of of getting into these letters because what you're talking about is is complicity in a way, the way that we become complicit, and the way in which we hide the truth from ourselves so that we can enjoy the very real benefits of a temporary arrangement or arrangement that doesn't have the kind of security that we normally want when we give ourselves, our bodies, and our hearts to somebody. So that's what we're going to handle in rapid-fire fashion is messy relationships. And I'll just get started and read the first letter, which is perfectly apropos. I love this. This person signs themselves as friends with bafflement. All right, here it is. Dear Sugars, I've got a problem that isn't necessarily distressing to me, but it is very perplexing. It has me feeling kind of stuck. The quick background is that I'm in a friends with benefit sexual relationship with my ex and best friend. Our friendship is one of the best things in my life. We're open with each other. We make each other laugh and we support each other. We both care very deeply about the other person and the sex is connected and amazing. This has been going on for a little over a year. We were together as a couple for a little under a year. Aside from sex, our behavior isn't all that different from when we were together. We hold hands in public, we're cuddly, we see each other and talk to each other more than we do with anyone else in our lives. We try not to be very physically affectionate in public to avoid confusing friends and family, though, and we definitely don't call each other boyfriend and girlfriend. Because we're so honest with each other, he knows I'm still a bit in love with him, and I know that he doesn't want to be a couple, and why. While this sounds like it could be a stressful or unfair situation because of the feelings being uneven, I am genuinely happy with what we have. I'm sure eventually the arrangement will end, and I do know I'll be sad and will miss the physical parts of our friendship when it does. So what's the problem? It's that I feel so much pressure to define the relationship further for the sake of others or to move on. My friends express concern that he should just, quote, make up his mind or admit that you're really a couple or that I should date. I've attempted to date too, but I find myself comparing my dates to the established and happy intimacy I already have, and I don't feel that would be fair to another person. I don't know what my next steps should be. Am I fooling myself that this is something that could make me happy for now? Am I setting myself up for heartbreak somehow? Is it possible to move on while staying so connected to the person I love most? Thank you, friends with bafflement. Friends with bafflement. Mm -hmm. You use the word arrangement to describe this relationship mm -hmm. you have with your ex. And I think that you have a relationship with your ex. You're essentially boyfriend and girlfriend without that commitment. And so I think that, you know, this question you're asking us, do I have to feel pressured to define the relationship? I think, you know, obviously only for yourself. And I think maybe you need to get clear with the fact that you really do have more expectations yeah. uh, than you care to admit. Essentially, you know, you're on the road trip that Cheryl was describing is what's happening. And you know, deeper, though, because yeah. so I honestly was just friends with this guy. This woman's in love with with right. the guy. She's in love with him. And it is absolutely true to address your questions, you know, very concretely. Am I fooling myself that this is something that could make me happy for now? You are not. It is making you very happy. It's making you sensationally happy. Yep. And you may, in a conscious way, decide that that temporary joy and happiness is worth what's to come. But the other questions are what's to come. Am I setting myself up for heartbreak somehow? Yeah, you probably are. You probably are. You are complicit in the way that all of us are complicit when we really dig somebody and there's an uneven amount of love. There is a power dynamic in every relationship and especially and especially powerfully in sexual romantic relationships. And he has the power to set the terms of the relationship. He is not interested in making this a permanent relationship. He's told you why. And you apparently have signed off on everything but long-term security, which is the biggest but there is in, when it comes to being in a relationship. Is it possible to move on while you're so connected to the person that you love the most? It is not. And you're not just trying to protect other people. You have a lover who you're in love with. You're not going to be available to anybody else. I define a really intimate relationship as you are the person who talks more about what matters really deeply with that one person. And that's the signifier that I see here. We see and talk to each other more than anyone else in our lives. That is going to end along with a sexual relationship and, you know, and, and whatever dreams you're kind of in a half-hidden way feeling, you know, it's going to end and you are going to feel probably devastated because what you describe is really 
being in love. So now you're taking a calculated risk. You know that there's going to be pain down the line and, you know, you can either confront that or you can, you know, step away from it and, and say, well, I'm enjoying what we have for the moment. And, but please know that that's going to come with a price. Yeah. We wish you luck. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Steve, you ready for our next letter? I am. Here we go. Dear Sugars, my boyfriend of four years and I recently decided to go on a break. We're both 32, and while we have a wonderful relationship, we live together and own a dog, we're both not feeling sure that we want to spend the rest of our lives together. This hesitancy led us to the idea of taking a break and ultimately dating each other as well as other people. Yes, I agreed to this. But a few days later, my ex-boyfriend made plans to meet an old college girlfriend I'd never heard of at a weekend music festival. He went to the festival and spent last weekend in her home state. He claims nothing has happened and they're just dating long distance. I feel totally betrayed and fooled. He says he thinks we have a chance to work out and he has feelings for me. I explained that I wanted to be someone's first choice and even though I agreed to our current situation, I'm not okay with dating him if he's dating other people. And I find it especially insensitive that he would be dating so quickly. His reaction was that if I feel this way, that's fair, but it will really be over and we would both need to move on. I'm afraid to end it completely because I don't want to lose him and I worry about having regrets, i.e. the one that got away. I want him to fight for me, but I feel that since he already has someone else in the wings, we're not on the same page emotionally. Is this a classic case of wanting to have his cake and eat it too? I'm afraid jealousy is clouding my judgment and my self-worth and making me forget my reasons for the break in the first place. Do we end it all now and go our separate ways, or do I try and spend time with him, knowing there's another girl he's investing in? Signed, Stuck in a Gray Area. Mm -hmm. So when I was thinking about this letter, I was thinking about uh, congressional politics, as I do so frequently when I think about these letters. There's this term that uh, has become really a sort of a, a major part of the political art in Washington. It's called poison pill. And what you do basically is you've got a bill that you don't really want to have passed, and so you put in an amendment or a rider that kills the bill. Politicians find a way when they don't want something to blame it on the other party, basically. And the reason I think it's relevant here is because your boyfriend, whatever he is, is trying to put the decision on you to end it. That's what I think at the bottom of it is what's going on here. I think that for you, him being invested in somebody else is a poison pill. You cannot accept it. I would bet that he had in mind that he wanted to maybe rekindle something with another woman to test his feelings in another relationship. But that doesn't mean that you should stick around for that experimentation or that constitutionally you're okay with sticking around. It seems to me what you've discovered you know, you reality tested the situation and your feelings changed and you don't like it. And it's true that jealousy might be cloud is no doubt clouding your judgment and especially at this point your self-worth. But I feel strongly that it's not a good idea to be in a relationship out of fear, that it's not a compelling enough reason to say, well, I've just got to consent to whatever arrangement we're going to make. Otherwise, the person's going to ditch because probably they're going to ditch anyway, if that's the case. And that's a difficult thing to face. But for me, what I would be doing if I were you is looking back at the reasons that you felt hesitant to commit to this guy. Because the way this is played out should give you some more reasons to be concerned about it. And within yourself, if it's clear that what this little experimental phase has proved to you is that you want to be with him in a committed way, then you have to tell him that. And then you run the risk of him saying, well, I don't want that. But make that be his decision. Don't let him push that decision onto you. Yeah, I agree. I don't think, Stuck, I don't think that you're on a break. I think the two of you broke up. Hmm. And you're both too afraid to do that. You've been together yeah. for four years. That's understandable. You're 32. You know, you've probably gone through a lot of transitions together over these years, a lot of growing up. Yeah. And, you know, I think that it's really natural to question at this point, four years into a relationship at the age of 32, do we go forward together or apart? It sounds to me like you really, you both made the decision to go on that break because you weren't sure you're, you wanted to go forward together, which usually means you don't want to go forward together. Right. But it's scary and hard to say that, yeah. especially because 
you usually still love that person you've spent those years with. You still do have that question in the back of your mind. Is this the one? Yeah. Am I going to go out there and date other people and think, oh, I should have stayed? Right. And, you know, that's a question that only time will answer. Yeah. My guess, Stuck, I'm going to agree with Steve on this. I think your boyfriend probably had some interaction with this old college girlfriend. But in any case, there's some heat between them. They've spent a couple weekends together. They're corresponding. You know, they're dating, and he's interested in dating her, and that's why he's not fighting for you. Yeah. I think he's being too nice, too tender, too afraid, whatever it is, to just I, tell you. I think he's being manipulative. <laughs> yes. I mean, but it's hard to hurt somebody. Yeah. It's hard to look someone in the eye and say, I love you. I respect right. you. I'm afraid to break up with you, but that's what I need to do. Right. It's one of the hardest choices I ever made in my life. Right. And so I sympathize, you know, for both of you, Stuck. Yeah. I do. But I think that this relationship at this point is over. And that doesn't mean that you might go off into the wide world and two years later reconnect with this old boyfriend and say, hey, let's get back together. But that's not a break. That's a, a decision. That's a decision to come back together. And so what I would say, my advice to you, is to let this go. It's, it's worth grieving. We all want somebody to fight for us. That's the thing that I think when you get to the end of a relationship, you're grieving, is you're no longer fighting for the other person. I think relationships are basically like a two-person group think. You can convince yourself of anything yeah. rather than really face that, that it's over or that it's over for one person. I mean, I've gone through so many contortions like the road trip that you described, Cheryl, so that I didn't have to confront within myself and to somebody else that I wasn't into them or contorted myself so that I wouldn't have to face that a person wasn't into me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, too, this... We've heard this before in letters. I want him to fight for me or her to fight for me. And the sad truth is n nobody will ever fight for you because you want them to. It just doesn't happen. I mean, here's the deal, Stuck. If your boyfriend wanted to be with you, he would be with you. He would be fighting for you. It's, it's not something that you can call up in him. It's something that only he can call up in himself. And, you know, he's even said to you, OK, you know, I understand your feelings, but then it's over. So it's over. It's over. It's a poison pill. All right, let's move on. Boy, these are cheery. Well, we said it would be messy. It's true. And it's proven to be quite it's messy true. indeed. All right, so let's hear another happy love story. Dear Sugars, I'm a 25-year-old woman dating a wonderful man who has just started his first year in a top graduate school program. We've been dating for almost two years and are moving forward with a long-distance relationship. He's busy at school, but has been wonderful about calling me on the phone, texting me, and keeping me in the loop with his new life. Our plan is to go no more than three weeks without seeing each other, and at the end of these two years, I will go wherever he gets a new job. My issue is not with him or our relationship. It is with a woman in his program. The two of them, along with a few other men in their class, took a long trip this summer before the school year started. They became very close very quickly and I worry she's starting to develop romantic feelings towards him. I went to visit a few weeks ago, and I thought she was friendly enough, although some of her comments did make me uncomfortable. At the end of one night out, he told me that he was confused with the way she was treating me, that she was not being very friendly and behaving oddly towards me. Of course, this upset me, but he reassured me that he would talk to her and that if she couldn't be nice to me, they could not be friends, period. This was last week, and I'm back home now. I haven't brought it up again because I don't want to make a big deal out of it or make him think I don't trust him. I trust him 100%, but this situation is still bothering me, and I don't want any paranoia or jealousy to damage our relationship. He's extremely busy, and I don't want to add more stress on top of it all. Do I ask him about it, or do I just drop it and trust that he's handling it appropriately? Sincerely, Paranoid Girlfriend. Paranoid girlfriend. Mm. I think you're being paranoid about the wrong thing. You don't need to worry about talking to your boyfriend about your feelings. I think that it's perfectly reasonable. You know, you had this conversation about this friend who you both feel weird about. It's not just your paranoia. He also brought it up with you and said that he thought that she was treating you oddly and, and not being friendly. So if you want to follow up on that conversation that began when you were visiting him, 
by all means do. And in some ways, by not bringing it up gives it so much more power. Yeah. It feeds that sense of paranoia. The way to not make a big deal about it is just to talk about it. The way to make a big deal about it is to do just what you're doing, right. writing to us and asking us what we think and, you know, sort of calculating every move. Yeah. So, of course, talk to him. That is the way to diffuse the emotion and paranoia around this problem. Yeah, I agree completely. And I'll sort of see you w one more, which is the terms of this relationship are somewhat skewed. There's a line in here, Cheryl, that you should think about, paranoid girlfriend. He's extremely busy, and I don't want to add more stress on top of it all. You don't take on stress by suppressing what you're really feeling and struggling with. In the relationship, you're already sacrificing for him a good deal. Yeah. He's going off to this top graduate school program, and what's going to happen at the end of those two years? Quote, I will go wherever he gets a new job. Right. Sometimes that can be symptomatic of a kind of acquiescence or passivity, and I, I counsel the opposite here. You need to definitely let him know how you feel, not in an accusatory way. you got to tell him, hey, I'm worried about this, especially when it's a long-distance relationship. That's where the communication has to be even better and even stronger because that's essentially the, the bond that you have. Yeah. And Paranoid, I want to congratulate you as well on – being concerned about the right things. You right. know, it does sound to me like this woman has a crush on your boyfriend. And so it's perfectly reasonable for the two of you to discuss this. Now, that's different than being paranoid and jealous of every female your boyfriend encounters or mm -hmm. becomes friends with in this program. And I think that there is that fine balance. You know, you you want to be open. You want to share feelings. You want to be on the same side. And you also want to be reasonable. Right. And there's only one other thing that I would think about, paranoid girlfriend, which is in this letter where you say that at the end of one night out, he told you, your boyfriend told you that he was confused with the way this woman in his program was treating you and that she wasn't being very friendly and behaving oddly towards you. And what happened essentially is a little thing that you were sort of picking up on a little bit, he said to you, is really a big thing. And that made you worry even more. And maybe he had the best of intentions consciously in doing that, but the actual effect of that is a kind of gaslighting. He's making you feel like there is a problem and there's tension. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, Upon reflection, I do think it's, it's sort of an odd thing to, to say to your girlfriend, but I also think it can be interpreted another way, which is in some ways it could also be seen that he was being honest with her. He was observing this woman mm -hmm. who he has interacted with without his girlfriend, and then now his girlfriend's on the scene, and she's being different. And so in some ways, I guess you could also argue, I'm going to argue, mm -hmm. if I put the boyfriend in the, in the best light here, that he was really trying to ally himself with his girlfriend and reassure her by, in some ways, right, you know, yeah, saying, okay, you're, you, it's not all in your head. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it is true that this woman has a crush. But, but that, to me, Cheryl, is what's kind of a little fishy here, is that he kind of put it in her head. She was a little uncomfortable, and with this news, he both makes her feel more uncomfortable and then says, but I'm going to take care of that. And she's going, take care of what? I'm not necessarily saying that he's a, consciously a bad actor mm -hmm. here. I don't think he is. I think he's a good guy. I think they're making an honest effort to do something that's really tough. And I think under that kind Kind of stress and strain, there's a part of him that m not consciously but unconsciously might be mm -hmm. trying to sort of make her aware that there are agitations in the ecosystem. And that's all the more reason why she needs to tell him, you know, I feel unsettled by this. Yeah. And where are we and what's going on? And, you know, she just needs to confess what's in her heart. And part of it was this little weird moment at the end of yeah. that night. You always got to poke the tiger. And by ZipRecruiter. Some job boards overwhelm you with tons of the wrong resumes. Not smart. But ZipRecruiter finds the right people for you and actively invites them to apply. Smart. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash sugar. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Dear Sugars, A few years ago, my husband and I had a foursome with our very best friends of 10 plus years. Afterwards, as to be expected, there were many emotions. The one that was not expected, however, was that my friend basically confessed through a letter that she had been in love with my husband for a number of years prior. We all four talked at length about the situation, and on the surface, we worked everything out and moved on with our daily lives. Deep down, I've struggled with extreme jealousy over this woman ever since. 
It drove me crazy when she suddenly became very good friends with one of my other best friends, and she even formed a deep and intimate relationship with one of my husband's best friends. I was very bitter toward her for over a year, and we hardly spoke to each other until I couldn't handle the daily thoughts of jealousy and hurt. I initiated a conversation, and we made up, and things finally felt normal again. But recently, it's flared up again, because she's leaving her husband. She's been very untruthful throughout, which really upset me, and she knows it. The thing that hurts me most is she makes no attempt to call or text me or mend our friendship, but she still contacts my husband, and they still have a friendship. I've told my husband how I feel, and he says he has no feelings for her, but why does he continue to have contact with her when he knows it upsets me? Is it right for me to not want him to talk to her? Am I crazy for thinking that this woman has intentions to take over my friendships and marriage? I feel like I've mended our friendship once already, and I don't have the strength to do it again. Actually, I don't want to be her friend anymore, but we have so many mutual friends now, thanks to her, it makes it extremely awkward in social settings. I can honestly tell you that I'm the most drama-free person, and this relationship with this woman is making me feel like a crazy person. Sincerely, over the drama. Over the drama, it, it sounds a little bit more aspirational to me than, than real. This situation you're in is a bad one, and it is very clear that this woman brings a certain kind of tumult into your life. In most ecosystems that, that are sort of functioning, you would just not even necessarily with ill will. You would just say, this is not tenable for me to spend time in my life with a woman who's in love with my husband, especially since you guys already had a foursome and, you know, you've seen one another naked in a number of ways. It is maybe a noble thing that you were able to m mend the relationship with her, but now she's in a state of disequilibrium again. She has probably sensibly for her split up with her husband. And probably because she is on her own and feeling unmoored, she's in touch with your husband, who she finds to be a source of comfort. And your husband, out of reasons having to do with maybe pity and vanity and feeling like the hero, and maybe he's turned on by her and remembers that thing that they had, whatever the combination of reasons are, she's still in his life and he's consenting to that. And that's actually not okay. And you just need to say to your husband, that's not okay. If Aaron came to me and said, you know that woman who's now divorced and we all had sex, remember, a while ago, and then she announced she was in love with you and now you're talking to her again? Um, well, she's going to be at the party. Aaron would say, well, we're not going to the party. And I, w I don't even know why she has your current email. That's okay. There are boundaries, and you need some boundaries. Again, not out of ill will, but just to preserve the thing that you have with your husband. Indeed. Boundaries. Boundaries. The beautiful thing about friendships is that friendships are sort of a unique relationship. And that they are among a group of relationships that you can kind of end without having, like, a big breakup. You know, obviously sometimes there are some you know, cases where you need to sit down a friend and say, it's over. I never want to see you again. I want you out of my life. But it sounds to me you can really just distance yourself from this woman. You have mutual friends. You're going to encounter her over the drama, probably in some social situations. That doesn't mean <laughs> right. that she should be texting your husband. Right. Over the drama, I, I love that, that signature because right there, I mean, if you're really over the drama, the only thing to do is, is to walk away from the drama. Right. And, you know, you either do that alone or you do that with your husband in relationship with your husband and i would say that hopefully your husband is in agreement with you i i am a little suspicious right of his relationship with her it does seem odd to me that he would continue to allow it knowing your feelings and also knowing the history that the two of them have yeah. so i would dig into that a bit Maybe there's more drama actually in your very own marriage than you suspect yeah. at this point. Maybe the drama isn't with this friend. Yeah. Yeah. But I do think that there's no question that you need to step back um, from this friendship so that you can have a drama-free life. Mm. Good luck. Good luck. Wow. Okay. Um, so uh, here is more drama. Hi, Sugars. I need some advice in a hurry. I'm 37, happily married with three kids. I have a friend, 38, divorced with three kids, who doesn't work but goes to school and receives government assistance. She is having a non-cancerous tumor removed in a month and just found out the home she's been living in is about to be sold and she has to move. My dilemma, 
and some back history. I met my husband at 18 in 1996. He was my second sexual partner. My first was a habitual cheater. My husband has never cheated. I totally trust him. In 2012, he opened up to me and we discussed fantasies. His was to watch me be with another man. We tried it. We became so much better as a couple, stronger and more in love. After three years of this, off and on, he stated he'd like to be with another woman and expressed interest in my friend, the one I mentioned who needs a place to live. I didn't like that idea. I did let him be with a woman we didn't know, and it totally crushed me. He still makes comments about being with my friend, but knows I'm not okay with it, and it will probably never happen. With that being said, how can I offer to help her and let her stay with us, knowing my husband's thoughts about being with her? I trust them both, but I feel nauseous thinking that they would both be in the house during the day together with no one else there. Or is it that I don't trust them? A good friend is in desperate need of help. What am I to do? Signed, it's only in my head or trust issues. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> this one's a pickle. It is. You know, again, though, I, I always return to this question, and I'm feeling this with a couple of the letters. It's like, talk to your partner. Yeah. You know, talk to your partner. The last couple of letters, it's like, yes, talk to your partner about the woman who might have a crush on him. Yes, talk to your partner about the woman who says she's in love with him and she's been texting him. Right. Talk about it. I, of course, I would feel uncomfortable, but the first person I would go to would be my husband. Mm. And I would say, we, we need to figure this out together. You know, I trust you and I want to help this friend, but I feel funny about what you've told me about your sexual desire for her. Hmm. And then together they go forward. Right. There are other ways to help a friend. You know, you don't have to offer your home. I, I'm assuming this lovely woman has, has many friends. And it's wonderful and noble that you want to help her. It's only in my head or trust issues. But I also think that there are other ways you could help her. If you really don't want this conflict to be there in your heart and in your home, Maybe give her a loan, you know, say, hey, how about I, I, you know, float you enough money to cover a hotel room or a place to stay for a few weeks, an Airbnb house that you can rent in, in the area or enlist other friends. I had a good friend about 10 years ago, suddenly had a health condition who she had to have surgery and she needed care for about two or three months. And she was single and she had a child and a whole bunch of us via email, like 30 friends reached out to each other. And we managed right. to sign up to bring her meals every single day for about three months. Right. And it was many hands, you know, make the, the work light approach. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's the other thing I'd suggest. So, you know, talk to your husband, work, see if you can work that out. And if you can't work it out, and if you still feel sort of funny, come up with another solution. There are lots of ways to help a friend. Yeah. I think that on the list of reasons that you would feel uncomfortable having somebody in your home, staying in your home, him wanting to have sex with your spouse or your spouse wanting to have sex with that person is, you know, it's toward the top of the list. It's a definite non-starter. He still makes comments about being with my friend. I mean, underneath this, it's reawakened this era of your life with your husband where you had very different sexual fantasies and desires. And you did what a lot of these letter writers do in the context of a relationship, messy relationship, which is reality test. And what you discovered is you're not OK with your husband being with another woman and especially another woman, understandably, that he has fantasized about and one who is also a friend to both of you that further muddies the water. It is not insensitive for you to place your health and happiness and the happiness and health of your marriage uh, before the immediate concern of welcoming this woman into your home. You don't have to do that in order to be a good friend. As Cheryl said, there are lots of ways to help out. But to me, I would view this as a bit of an invitation. Why is husband still talking about this friend who he still fantasizes? I mean, every time he mentions that, he has to know that it's a barbed hook that's going into your flesh. You know, that's an issue. Yeah. Talk about boundaries. I think that, that that's that's one absolutely that needs to be said. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to hear you talking about having sex with my friend. That's not asking too much at all. So you have the right to do that. It's only in my head or trust issues. And we wish you the best with the situation and your friend also in her in her health situation. Mm -hmm. One more letter. One more. In the messy relationship episode. Yeah. Rapid fire. Yep. Dear Sugar. I am 31 years old, and the last three men I dated were fresh out of serious relationships. They all left within months because they weren't ready. 
A few months ago, I met and fell for a man going through a bad divorce. His wife had an affair, continuing in secret for months once it was discovered. He tried desperately to hang on for his two young kids, but the marriage fell apart. He says he no longer loves her, but his deep hurt and anger towards her are obvious. Our chemistry and connection were clear from the day we met. He constantly told me how strong his feelings were for me. We live on different coasts, so we met up in between. I flew across the country often, and we talked or texted around the clock. He opened up to me about everything. While it wasn't my favorite subject, I liked that he felt he could talk to me about his divorce and that I helped him through it. Last week, I told him it was clear he wasn't ready for our relationship, and he agreed. His heart is still closed, and he doesn't want to put me through what he went through, being patient, hoping someone's heart will change. He said he'll know when he's ready, and asked if I wanted him to call me when he is. I said yes. I know he needs to do this on his own, and I need to move on, but it's difficult to do that knowing that if we met a year from now, or had met before his marriage, this could have been it for us. I was falling in love with him, and we had arguably the best relationship either of us has ever had. Do I have to completely disconnect and move on for now? He suffers from seasonal depression, and I worry about how he'll be this winter. I don't want to abandon him as a friend, and I want him to think of me when he's ready. More than anything, we are friends, and it's difficult to disconnect from someone I care so deeply about when they're struggling. Can I call him to check in, or will that only hurt me? Should I give up all hope for a future with him one day? Would I always be second to a woman who cheated on him? Will he ever move on and be able to trust and love again? Sincerely, hurt by the hurting. Mm. Last week I told him it was clear he wasn't ready for a relationship and he agreed. That is a great thing that you did. Mm -hmm. That is a tough thing that you did, but it was absolutely the right thing to do. And, you know... It, I need to move on, but it's difficult to do. Yes, it is. That's how you know that it's the right thing to do. I have a strong feeling, hurt by the hurting, th that you are not ready to be just a friend and a support to him. Over and over in these letters, we really are hearing how it's generally women in the letters that we, we've read, they consent to an arrangement that is exasperating, humiliating, degrading, provokes paranoia and doubt and jealousy and envy and disempowers them. And it's hard not to because we're all junkies for intimacy. And we, when we find somebody who offers a lot of those things, it's very tough to, to turn away from. But it's very clear that if you do call in and try to maintain a friendship with this person, it's going to hurt you. And it's also pretty clear that your motive is that you want him to think of you when you're still holding a torch for him. Maybe you will have a future with this guy, but it's certainly not going to be by consenting to an arrangement where you are always there unconditionally for him. You have a right to assert what you really need and want in this relationship. I, th I would say actually you have a moral debt to ask for what you really need. And if it's not on offer, then you, I, I, as difficult as it is to do, you really have to seek it from a person who is willing to give you that. And when you consent, whether it's a boyfriend who's off in grad school or you know somebody who says, let's just be friends with benefits, you're really consenting to an arrangement that is fundamentally unfair to you. Yeah, it's really reading this letter and reflecting on all the letters that we've answered on this episode sad to see they're all from women this messy yeah. relationships theme that we're talking about today the really the other title the alternate title for this show today could be women who are not getting what they should be getting from the men who claim to love them and when that happens those women need to take responsibility for their own lives it's kind of like the story i told at the beginning yeah. it wasn't it wasn't my friend's fault that he was still in love with his ex-girlfriend and not in love with me because I said it was okay. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I'll have sex with you every night and it won't mean anything for me. And then I'll sit there and have dinner and watch you fawn all over this other woman and I won't have an, an emotional reaction. Right. But what happened is I did have an emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. That was my heart speaking. Right. That was my body telling me the truth, right. which is that it wasn't so easy for me to go between being friends and lovers. Right. That in some secret weird place, even though I didn't want more from that specific man, right. I wanted more from the man I was having sex with. Right. And so I went out into my life knowing that. Right. And I think in Hurt by the Hurting, what you're saying is you, you want a partner. 
You know, you want a boyfriend. You want somebody who is ready for a relationship. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that this is all over. It is true that the guy's too fresh off of a divorce to be ready for a relationship. That's a really valid statement. He told you the truth when you asked him. And, you know, you were brave enough to ask for that truth. Right. And the cool thing about life is that, you know, if he decides two years from now that he wants to look you up and call you up and ask you out again, he will do it. You don't have to stay connected to him to make him do that. Yeah. Okay. People do what they want to do. He won't forget about you. If you don't call him for two years and he wants to connect with you again, he'll connect with you again. Right. So keep faith with that. Get your own feet under you. Go into your life. See what happens. Allow yourself to fall in love with somebody else. Allow yourself to hold a space in your heart for this this friend that you parted with, knowing that you don't know what's next in your life together. Right. And, you know, the, the one thing that, that comes up over and over again, and we can see it in this letter very powerfully, is there's a backstory. There's a relationship that you have to yourself. You're 31 years old, and the last three men you dated all in a row were fresh out of serious relationships, and they all left within months because they weren't ready. Okay, so there's some pattern that it clearly is compelling you to get involved with men. Maybe they're more emotionally vulnerable, available. Maybe for whatever reason, this is now four in a row. So that at this point, you have to say, well, there's something about their vulnerability, whatever it is that makes them attractive to me. This is progress. I know it doesn't feel like that, but at least in this case, they didn't leave you because they weren't available. You identified that this person really isn't ready to be with me, and I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with being the backup with being the crying rag. I want a full-fledged relationship with this other person, and I want the totality of their heart, not just sort of the damaged parts that I can help heal. That's progress, even though it doesn't feel like that. That feels to me very profound. That's right. Wow. Messy relationships. I feel so bad for you on this road trip. You're having a great time, and you've like, you know, I was sold. I'm like, this is going to be great, man. It's actually, I treasure, I treasure that experience hmm. because it, it was a hard lesson and we do not forget the lessons we learned the hard way. Yeah. I felt stung and I never forgot it and I changed my life because of it. Hmm. I mean, that's the whole deal with life, you know, let the things that hurt you change you. Hmm. And it wasn't a major hurt. It wasn't like I was, you know, weeping, you know, in my bed every day. But I just thought, ouch, don't do that again. Yep. And I didn't. Yep. And so I think that that's really the best advice we can give to any one of these people. When you when you have that feeling like, you know what, I don't want my husband to text with a woman who wrote us a long letter saying she's in love with him. Right. Or I don't want to play second fiddle to somebody's ex-wife when he's not over this woman yet, right. or any number on and on and on, right. what we say is then don't do it. Right. And it's up to you to make that choice not yeah. to do it. All these women who wrote us these letters, they're in some ways the kind of, I don't want to quite say in the victim role because that I think is, is too too harsh. But I will say that each of them is writing out of a place of feeling sort of powerless. Yeah. And what I want to say to all of them is the power is yours and it has been all along. And it's up to you to grasp it, to inhabit it. Mm -hmm. And that is a hard thing to do. But the minute you do it, your life will be better for it. Yeah. You can do it. You can do it. It's been another episode of Dear Sugar Radio. It Thank has. you, Steve, for this conversation. Oh, we, my God. We weren't meant to have much of a back and forth, but it ended up being, you know, this rapid fire approach. I think my first response was like, are we going to be able to go deep enough? And I feel like a really interesting thing happened mm -hmm. as we had this discussion, that these letters were talking to each other. They were. Yeah. And that part of the conversation wasn't just you and I reflecting upon the letters. It was the, the things that these letter writers can teach each other by telling mm -hmm. their own stories. Right. So we thank you, listeners, for writing to us and sharing your stories with us. Dear Sugar Radio is produced by WBUR in Boston. We're produced and edited by Lisa Tobin. Yes. The very non-messy Lisa no, Tobin. No, nothing. It's dad. all smooth sailing with Lisa. We're recording a talkback sound and visual in my hometown, Portland, Oregon. Yes. Our engineer is Josh Millman. Listen and subscribe on iTunes, 